Olá pessoal, seja bem-vindo ao Nova Talk, o um Nova Talk Internacional e muito esperado com a presença do grande ator René Aubergenois. <risos> Well, René, uh, first of all, I'd like to ask, let's talk a, a lot about Star Trek, and I want to ask you about a role you got before you, you went to, to do Odo, ah. which was that little part in Star Trek VI. How that came about? Um, it came about uh, in undis the undiscovered country. It came about because Nicholas Meyer was a friend, and um, he called me one day, and he said he was work he was about to begin work on this uh, production and he said he was asking he was going to his friends and asking them to do cameos that's a nice word for a tiny part um, and he said would you be interested in doing a, a cameo in uh, a Star Trek feature uh, and I said <clears throat> Nick, sure, that would be fun. I'd love to work with you. We had worked together. I said, I'd love to work with you, but um, if I get a real job, I'll have to... Do. And he said, yeah, 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 because it won't be big enough that we can't replace you at the last minute. So then I said I would do it, and then I had to go and um, get the uniform, and then that was all a big deal. And um, I remember I was in... Um, Ireland visiting my father and I got all these calls from uh, from Hollywood from the Paramount that they they needed to do a, a mold of my face because I was going to be <clears throat> in the story I was a Starfleet officer who was conniving against the Federation uh, with the help and he was going to be disguised as a Klingon and trying to assassinate the head of the Federation, if I remember it even correctly. <clears throat> and so they didn't, they were going to fly somebody over, but, it, but I was coming back and we did it in New York and then they had it and, um, and they were ready uh, to do it and I came and I shot for one day, I shot uh, Colonel West and uh, oh, I shot. And then there was the day when I was going to try and assassinate the president or the head or whatever. <clears throat> and um, but they had a stunt man in the Klingon makeup who was going to fall out of the thing when the, when his plot was foiled. So anyway, I shot it, and it was fun, and it was great. And then um, right before the movie came out. Nick called me and he said, I have to tell you something, I'm so embarrassed. Because of time constraints, we've changed the story and you're not going to be the assassin anymore. You're still going to do all the stuff that you did as Colonel West, but you won't, we changed the story. So <clears throat> they did, and I never saw the film. Then my first Star Trek convention, because then I moved into uh, Deep Space Nine, was uh, in Chicago, and I was very nervous, and because the fans knew everything. Um, in fact, I, I wasn't even supposed to be there. Colomini was going to do it, and he couldn't do it, and we were shooting Deep Space Nine. He said, would you go and do it? And I said, I, won't, I don't know anything about it. I won't. He said, they'll know more about it than you know. So I went and um, I was out there and I was answering questions and somebody raised their hand and they said, um, what was it like to play Colonel West? And I thought, I don't know who Colonel West is. I don't remember playing Colonel West. And I thought, my mind is going like this, and I thought, well, I had done two television movies on Wild Wild West Wild yeah. Wild West Revisited. <laughs> so I thought that's what it was about. And I started to talk about that. And the audience started, <laughs> they started to really distrust me. And then because they went, you're the Colonel West in, and, and then I discovered what it was they were talking about. But 
an interesting thing about that was the movie came out and they had changed it so that Colonel West was no longer the assassin. Then when they released it on video, they changed it back to the way it was originally. So that was nice because then people saw me uh, on the video. And then <clears throat> now the Blu-ray, they put it back to the way it was in the movie <laughs> here. So I've gotten a part and lost the part and gotten a part and lost it. Okay. Um, the Brazilian fans would like to have give you a gift. Oh my God. You, you, you will not believe it, but this, this bucket uh -huh. was used in a... Uh, how do I say? To play a uh, uh, theater, play. we have uh, play. A small play. sketch play. of theater uh -huh. and the conventions. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And in 1993, they done one with the bucket. And this bucket, <laughs> since 1993, was the most famous <laughs> <laughs> character of this group. And the bucket is yours, Obalde. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know what? This is wonderful. Thank you for this. Wait a minute. <laughs> um, no, this is, this is wonderful. But I tell you what I'm going to do. Because I can't take this home in the luggage. <laughs> fit into my suitcase. So maybe I'll sign it. Oh, wow. No. And... And uh, maybe they can auction it off for charity or oh, something. Oh, oh thank so you, thank somebody you. Somebody can have it. And you, it's not a very good, we can't put water in it anymore. But, <laughs> but everybody reminds you when they see the back. Well, that's you, wonderful. You are reminded in our convention since 1993, I think. Fantastic. <laughs> so, so I'll sign it and we'll uh, auction it. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you. Well. Talking about buckets, we have to talk about Odo. Okay. And uh, of course, uh, it's an alien. You, you've talked a lot how related to Spock and Data he is, but he's somehow different because all those aliens in Star Trek, they normally are culturally different, but they're biologically, they're the same. And Odo, on the other hand, is very different. He's, he's, he's a, a shapeshifter, mm -hmm. he's in a liquid state. How that information uh, informed your performance in terms of posturing? Uh, and uh, How did you develop the character from, from this, this fact that he's biologically different? And thanks to stay here by biological human shape. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I have to be very honest. I... Um, I, I felt that the shape-shifting, the fact that he was a liquid form, was interesting. And, I, and um, as a character actor, the fact that he could change into different characters was interesting. But the act of changing, the technology, the special effect of the change, I didn't find that all that interesting, mostly because I didn't do it. I was, the computer did it. <clears throat> and also because I felt that it was, and I was proven correct, that the audience, because they've seen that effect in uh, Schwarzenegger's film, and, um, yeah. and then it was in commercials, they would do things like that. I thought, well, they're going to get bored with that. It, they're not going to get bored or with, the, with the idea that he's capable of doing that. But, you know, in fact, in the seven years, they didn't do it very often. I didn't really change shape. It was such a strong concept that they didn't need to do it very often. The audience always knew that. And when you know that the audience knows something about you, you don't really have to do anything. It, they're, they're doing all the work for you. So I didn't think about it very much. Um, I, 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 remember <coughs> I remember later in the show when Odo and Kira are lovers, they did um, a sequence where 
they, Odo and Kira, conjoined, came together. And it was all a special effect. And once I moved to her, I, did, I went away. I didn't have to work that day. Um, Nana, visitor, Kira, did all the, and then they put all the special effect into it. And when I saw it afterwards, uh, it was beautiful and amazing. And I said to Nana, I said, man, you really made me look like a hot lover. <laughs> <laughs> so. uh, you participated of many conventions in all the world. What do you rem remind, remember that you, you can tell us about something Peter's thing, different thing that you remind? Uh, how different? Oh, they, well, some things. From, oh, um, that country was very different. Yeah, than, uh, you yeah. know, the amazing thing is people who don't go to conventions, they have a, a kind of a, an idea of like, so if I say I'm going to a Star Trek convention, they say, oh, yeah, all those crazy people in the costumes, that, that must be really weird, huh? And, um, <clears throat> and I think... I thought that would be the way it was when I first started going to conventions. And there are people who dress up in costumes, in the uniforms, but for the most part I've learned that, you know, you cannot make a generality about a mass of people. There are good people, there are bad people, there are funny people, there are tall people, there are short people, there are uh, people who are there because they love the fantasy, and there are people there who love it because they love the message or, they, or they're interested in the science of it. <clears throat> but overall, as I say, you can't make a generality, but overall, the intelligence of the audience, the questions that you get. A lot of the questions are the same because people are curious and have something so that you learn, oh yeah, I know, two and a half hours for my makeup. But, <clears throat> but overall, I'm, and my wife, Judith, um, says to friends, you know, I, I'll be talking to a Star Trek fan and I'm thinking, oh, they're, you know, they're a fan, they're fanatic. And then I'll realize that I'm talking to one of the inventors of the Xbox game. Or, you know, and, and I've met people uh, at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., major uh, PhD doctors and people involved in the highest reaches of science who are avid Star Trek fans. So it goes from little children who say, how do you change like that? Because they totally accept that as a reality to, um, to major scientists. So <clears throat> as I go around the world, and, and I will be anxious to meet the fans here in Brazil, <clears throat> As I go around the world, I, I recognize that there is a common thread, a human connection, which is really what Gene Roddenberry was talking about from the very beginning, that we are all, we are all aliens. I am an alien here in Brazil, and yet I am accepted uh, and recognized and that is a great gift. And that's uh, the gift that the conventions give, that Star Trek has given me and everybody who's been involved in it over the years. Um, well, Deep Space Nine is now 25, but <coughs> it doesn't show, right? It, it has a format that is very modern, the serializing of it, uh -huh. and, uh, but at the time it was odd, right? Not many shows worked like that. 
at the time, what did, what did you think about this? Did you think, oh, I'm doing something kind of weird, I don't know if that's gonna work out fine? Or did you feel, well, we're doing something that is excellent and that is going to modernize TV as, as it has done? Well, I certainly didn't have that kind of you know, prescience. But we were all aware when we were shooting Deep Space Nine that it was making a pretty big departure from the original. We knew that we could not exist without the original, that we, uh, that we were direct descendants and that we had to continue the story. But we knew that, that there was a big change. For one thing, we were on a space station. We weren't going out into space. And for the audience, we immediately started to hear reservations about, well, but you don't go anywhere. You don't, you don't, you're not going to places, different places. That's what we like about it. And that's what we want to see. You're not going anywhere. And I would say, well, you know, None of, none of the shows went anywhere. We were all on a sound stage. Well, we were on stage 18, and uh, the next generation was across the alley. It's all in the mind. We only go where our mind takes us. But we also were very aware that our show, because it was breaking new ground, but also because it was following the next generation, which had this enormous success and reinvigorated the whole world of Star Trek. Um, we, we were aware that we were not everybody's favorite show. And so we sort of like, yeah, well, we're gonna do what we do. And, but we were like the middle child who never got the attention we deserved. But I have to say that Armin said it and, and I think it was, he said to me one day, we were sitting around after a convention where people had reservations about it. He said, you know, 20 years from now, they're gonna love our show because, because it's different and because of the change of the serialization, continuing the stories. And I think the dark quality of it um, the sort of punk steam look of it, the roughness of it, that will help it, you know, all, and it won't help, it. all science fiction, 10 years after you do it, is sort of quaint. You know, it requires the audience um, to, uh, to achieve a, a a willing suspension of disbelief. And that's what they do with the original show, which if you look at it now, if you look at it as a cynic, with a cynical eye, it, it's kind of, well, you know, you could say, well, that's silly. But that's not what the root of it was. The root, the truth of it, just like any classic, whether you go back to Shakespeare or the Greeks or wherever, the truth, it may change, the style changes over the years, but if it's true, the truth does not die. And I think that's what Deep Space Nine achieves, and it's protected to a degree. I mean, we'll, we'll look funny and quaint, just like all, any, any story that tries to tell you what the future is gonna be, once you get to that place, and it isn't really that way, th then you can discount it. But you can't if the very basis of it is truth. Truth. And we're now living in a world where too many people are lying, and so we are very lucky to be artists who get a chance to tell the truth. Well, thank you <coughs> to accept our invitation. We are very, very f happy to, to receive you in Brazil, to, stay, to have you in the stage in our convention, and uh, thank you 
so much. So thank, much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Luis. Thank, thank you, everyone. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>